All right, so we are going to start Intro to Pharmacology and the Nursing Process and LPN Practice, which is going to start off with Chapter 1, which is going to go over the basics of subjective versus objective data, as well as RN roles, the delegation process, um, as well as the LPN role, so that we have a generalized understanding of the, uh, the differentiation between the two, because this is going to be part of uh, your knowledge base learning that is going to be on examinations, it's going to be on HESIs, it is going to be on um, exit material to complete your program, and of course the NCLEX. And again, this is just reiterating that we're going to be talking about administration of safe practice of medications, as well as uh, the differentiation between subjective versus objective data, which again, you are absolutely going to need to understand um, and be able to pick and point out the difference between subjective versus objective data when you do these examinations. Um, it, that is a very, very hot spot and key point for this class, uh, as well as uh, health assessment and fundamentals. So uh, you're going to see those often when you're going through this process of subjective versus objective data is a very big portion of your examination. Um, especially in the beginning, and then I believe it comes back again in the final. So we need to make sure we're really paying good attention to that. Now in this chapter, we get a lot into nursing tasks and the process for the LPN and looking at the difference in the two. Um, as of a post-COVID world, LPN tasks and roles have changed drastically. Uh, before the perception of an LPN's job and the limitation, honestly, for most conditions uh, for most LPNs was that they were in uh, an extended care facility, like an LTAC, um, sometimes like an acute care situation, but never in a traditional hospital situation. Uh, again, there is varying levels of de degrees of, of, of change here and there, but by and large, that was kind of how it went. Um, they were largely uh, underutilized and um, completely understaffed and their ratio for medications that they would have to pass is she's anywhere from usually 1 to 25 to 1 to 30 so that's a lot going on um, and we're focusing or we're focusing on uh, basically just pushing medications as fast as you can that became the standard um, kind of quiet level of practice which was bizarre in itself um, but when COVID struck a lot of the nurses left. Um, matter of fact, it was about 20% within the first couple of weeks of them going and announcing that COVID was, you know, a, a problem nationwide. So at that point, um, LPNs kind of jumped in and said, dude, you got to let us come in. You got to let us play, right? You got to let us in, coach. You got to let us in like a football player. Um, and finally, we, we got it together and we did it. And I, I tell you, it has really changed the way we understand um, how to utilize LPNs. Uh, we are understanding their level of uh, perception, which is, I think, is a great and beautiful thing because these guys are sharp. And unfortunately, the stereotype and the level with which we chose collectively in medicine to utilize them, again, was by and large, way below the level of skill that they truly had within. So, um, yeah, things are changing. Uh, salaries are coming up. Opportunities are wide open uh, in a hospital setting, and I couldn't be more stoked about it. All right, so very quickly, we're going to be getting into um, RN licensure and what it is that they can do versus what an LPN can do. And basically, they, they being the RNs, um, complete all steps of the nursing process, which we're about to get into in the next couple of slides. Um, the LPN or the LVN is going to work under the supervision of the RN. And again, under the supervision of the RN, that's kind of dictated by what hospital policy looks like, what the RN has delegated, things of that nature. And it changes um, and fluctuates in degree of difficulty. Um, it's kind of a bob and weave, just as triaging people is, or just like uh, getting a direct admit and an unexpected person coming in. It just, it's the, the, the life of medicine, right? So there's a lot of variance and change. Of, of what that looks like from uh, a full-on standpoint. So again, LPNs commonly employed in nursing homes 
LTACs, things of that nature, outpatient clinics, home health agencies, and again, extend to hospital due to the nursing shortage. And I hope that never, never, never deviates because boy, oh boy, are we ever figuring out how valuable it truly is. So um, again, drug administration is a very large part. Also patient management on patients who are about to be discharged. Also the discharging process. I mean, these guys are so valuable in getting our patients out of the door, making sure their discharge is final, making sure their education is complete, doing all the things that need to be done so that these guys don't become what they call a 30 day readmit, which is where we didn't do a good enough job. And that patient comes back within the first month of being seen and being discharged. And we end up looking like we didn't do our job. And this is going to directly affect our hospital costs and our overall yield at the end of the year and what that's going to look like for salaries for nurses for the following year. So it's a very complicated process. All right, so there is an order and uh, steps of the nursing process. So in order, it's assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation, and evaluation. And what exactly does that mean? Well, what it means is um, whenever a nurse goes through the process of understanding the uh, the the level of degree of knowledge needed in order to understand where this patient's coming from, where this patient's going to go, what they need for the future to get them discharged. All right. So that whole entire, from the second you see a patient, you try to get them discharged. You do this in a process of five steps and it starts off um, with uh, assessment, right? And we're going to get into each and every one of these and what that means. And uh, once we get to the evaluation portion, this is around the time that we are um, getting someone prepared for some type of discharge. And it might not be today, but when we say we're preparing for discharge from the second they come in, uh, what that means is, is we are preparing to get them out of the door as fast as we can so they have better health outcomes. So let's go into the next slide and then see what all this exactly means. All right, so from a nursing process, um, when we look at an assessment, we need to understand an RN, um, they must perform the initial assessment for each patient. Why? Well, there's a lot going on with an assessment that is not necessarily something that an LPN is prepared to do. Um, I, like I understand that LPNs can have 15 years under their belt, but there are a lot of other things that you have to look at and anticipate um, from a practitioner or a provider level um, that you don't technically have from the level of an LPN. You guys are more technically savvy. Uh, you guys have, are skill buffs. Like I, I dare somebody say that uh, an RN can perform an LPN skill just as well um, if it is a brand new LPN versus a brand new RN. Like hands down, LPNs just gonna just gonna attack it, right? Just annihilate it. Um, but from a spatial and abstract perception and perspective, the way you have to look at it is very very different on an RN level. Not good or bad or anything from that nature, just different. Sometimes difference is different. So it's a matter of being a subject matter expert, looking at things from a layered perspective, which is why um, we would have to do the full assessment. And then, of course, after that, we can pass it along to the LPM because we, we understand what that, uh, that entire scenario is going to look like from an anticipatory perspective. Um, so critical thinking, looking, listening, all of these things are part of that assessment process. I need to understand that if this patient is here with chest pain, has a history of GERD, but also has a family history of diabetes and heart disease, and this patient had a chest pain that when they sit down, they are relieved, and when they stand up and start moving around, they're having pain, I need to know that this is more cardiac related versus more GERD related. And those symptoms, with the exception of one little piece of that information, are very, very alike in a lot of ways. So uh, from an RN standpoint, I would let the physician know what that looked like, anticipate we're probably gonna be getting troponins in a set of three, go ahead and get the blood ready for that so that we can you know, get our numbers back, get an EKG, like there's a whole standard process we have to use. Um, that I would expect would come along. Um, and also, I would need to look at other labs and see where those things are going to directly affect the patient as well. Um, 
Again, I need to know, is this, is there a history of this issue? What happened last time? Do we have imaging? Do we have labs from the last time? Were we seen even? What does that even look like? Um, all of this is going to be within the assessment process, uh, the initial assessment process on a patient to kind of, again, put that picture together in our head to see what we need to anticipate to get them better quicker. Okay, so let's get into the two types of data. We have subjective data, and that is generally obtained through patient questioning. Sometimes it's family questioning. Sometimes we have to ask whoever's around that was a witness because maybe our patient um, is, is comatose at the moment. Uh, or is unable to clearly dictate information for whatever reason. Maybe they're having a stroke. Like, there's a lot of scenarios, right? So subjective data, I always say, is subject to probably being wrong. And it just is an easier way for me to remember that. Now, how is that a thing? Well, remember, it's not that the patients are lying to me necessarily. It's just the patients don't understand what it means to have their disease process a lot of times. Case in point. I ask somebody if they have a history of uh, diabetes. They say, no, I don't have diabetes. I'm like, all right, cool, no big deal. I look at their A1C, I see it's trash. Um, and then I say, are you sure you don't have any issues with that? Do you take blood sugars or whatever? And they're yeah, like, oh yeah, yeah, I got the sugars. I'm like, well, you got the sugars, but you ain't got diabetes? No, no, I got the sugars. All right, so this is a prime example, right? So it's not that they're just trying to play games with us is a lot of times they don't really understand what that means. So when we're getting uh, this assessment, we need to understand that if it comes out of their mouth, it might not exactly be what they think it is, right? Truly, there are a lot of people who have been told they have precancer cells, they have those precancer cells removed. When we talk to them about uh, history, they will let us know that they had cancer removed, right? So here's another prime example of what that looks like, because again, their perception is completely different. So that is why that is considered subjective data. Also, a lot of times um, people cannot think rationally when they're in pain. That's an obvious one. So their perception of how long or how short something took place is going to be completely different than if you, are, or, you or I saw it from a third person perspective, right? So pain um, at a 10 out of a 10 is going to feel like it went on for ages. Whereas us watching it, it could have just been a couple of minutes, right? So there are a lot of reasons that we would consider this subjective versus objective. Now, looking at objective data, I have an object that measures its validity, all right? So this is how I remember objective. I have an object that measures its validity and it being uh, the, the information that we are given. So case in point. Patient is five foot eight. Well, how did I measure that? Uh, I measured it with a ruler, right? Or a measuring tape, because that's what we do. Um, patients, you know, 58 years old. Well, how, were I, how was I able to measure that? Well, because I had their driver's license, right? So their date of birth is on their driver's license. Measured, done. Um, they have a history of hypokalemia. How do I know that? Well, the last time they were in the hospital, we treated them for hypokalemia, and I had um, their lab levels, right? Same for imaging, same for things of that nature. Um, another thing, if a doc says, hey, patient has a history of cancer in 1995, that is considered objective data because it's coming from a healthcare professional that it has the ability to confirm that, okay? So again, keep those things in mind, being able to differentiate subjective versus objective. And then remember your hacks. Subjective data means it's subject to be wrong, right? And objective is an object that measures the validity of the statement. All right, let's go into the next slide. And again, very quickly, uh, we're looking at the different types of um, sources of information for the assessment process. Obviously, um, a lot of these are objective and some are subjective. Again, the patient would be subjective, labs would be objective, family would be subjective. Medical records, objective imaging, objective history, um, more than likely objective, but we need to specify if it's coming from like a MAR or um, some part of epic charting or if it's coming from the history from, I don't know, mom because patient's incapacitated. Uh, obviously, mom would be subjective. Objective would be something that's already in our database systems. And then healthcare providers would be considered objective.
All right, so the next thing we're going to learn about are uh, obtaining objective data and the techniques that are used. This is going to be the order with which we are going to be obtaining objective data. And there is one exception, and that's when we are doing the abdomen. So I will get into that later of the order because I don't want to mess with you right now with it. I want to get this standard part in your head and comfortable before we start changing it up for any reason. I'll explain why we get into it when we do get into it. All right, so first, inspection. So this is the part where I stare down my patient and I note things in my brain very quickly. So what can I learn about a patient just staring them down? Well, I can learn actually a lot. So looking at my patient, I can actually count their respirations just by watching them talk. I can also dictate whether a person is going through any type of pain. Why? Because I can see if they're flinching or guarding. What does that mean? Well, if they're flinching, it means they are guarding their body um, to, to uh, separate their perception of that pain in their brain, right? So guarding would be holding that piece or part and pushing into it or making sure nobody touches it, right? And then um, the flinch itself uh, could be flinching of the eyes or it could be a physical flinch where they can't move in any other direction without more notable pain. Um, I can also see if a person... Um, has any type of cognitive delay. How could I do that by staring someone down? Where if they're not tracking me while I'm walking, then that is a good indicator that there might be something wrong. I mean, if someone cannot visually see me four foot in front of them walking back and forth and while I'm looking at them, then why are they not technically engaged? Is there, is there some kind of mental health deficiency? Is there a cognitive delay? Is there a problem with executive processing? Can they even see me? Like these are the things that I'm thinking about while I'm inspecting a patient. Are they following along the lines of what I'm asking them? If I ask them what's one plus one plus two, are they telling me green? What does that mean, right? Again, inspecting uh, the verbiage that they're using. So it's not necessarily staring them down. It's also inspecting the observations uh, that are going on around you while you're going through the other processes of your assessment. So palpation what does that mean why would we palpate okay well we're physically in touching feeling uh, like temperature I would use the back of my hand to see if the person feels warm or cool right uh, palpation I am going to uh, palpate your legs to see if you have swelling or what they call edema things of that nature um, I'm gonna palpate your nail bed and I'm going to see if your capillary refill is under three seconds like it's supposed to be uh, to let me know that your oxygen saturation is good. All right, so now we have percussion. Percussion is an old way of doing things, but it's still just as effective as it was a billion years ago when we used it. Percussion is the idea of creating timpani over a body area or over um, an abdomen is a really good place. So you can physically hear the change in timpani from a very dense knocking um, to a very hollow knocking when you are using percussion. Um, and that would indicate that you are going over a liver, right? So you could actually see, is this liver large or is it small or does it feel like something might be wrong with it using uh, the changes of uh, the tone of the timpani in the body and usually when you hear something that's light and airy it's usually over a hollow organ like the uh, stomach itself um, so very very useful and then of course auscultation is when we lightly press down and we listen to the inside so the reason we call this least invasive to most invasive isn't because of the amount of pressure we're putting on a patient it is because how far into the body system am I truly invading? So that's why we say inspection is least invasive and auscultation is most invasive versus something that most people think would be palpation. Because when I'm listening, I'm listening to the dead center part of your heart, right? No amount of palpation is going to get me that deep unless, you know, I'm compressing a patient and they don't have a heartbeat. So there's no point in listening anyways. So just keep it in your brain. This is the order with which it's in. It's from least invasive to most invasive, and this is why, and you should be good to go. All right, so things we need to consider when we're looking at the patient and assessing them. We need to think about drug therapy and what this is going to mean. Um, we need to make sure that they understand the signs and the symptoms. Heck, that we understand the signs and the symptoms. A lot of times nurses uh, won't traditionally know um, the biggest symptoms on patients. Yeah, with blood pressure medication, we're going to 
look out for orthostasis. That's that's a given. But what else are we going to look out for? If I notice a patient is non-compliant on medication because it makes them cough, all right, cool. You should know that's lisinopril that's causing that problem more than likely, and you need to get them off of it, and you need to change it because the patient really needs to take their medication. So you need to know all the little nuances of that medication because, yeah, lisinopril is going to potentially give you that first pass effect of having a lower blood pressure and cause orthostasis. That's, that's given. More importantly, the reason that people don't take that medication is because of that side effect. And if you don't know that side effect is attributed to that medication, you're just going to keep giving it to them. We're going to have some massive issues because... Patient's going to keep getting worse and worse with their hypertension until they finally blow a gasket, have a stroke, or even worse, and then the, the whole bottom's dropped out, and it's because we just didn't ask a couple of simple questions because we didn't know a medication. I mean, it's really it's really that serious, friends. I, I, I don't mean to be so bleak, but sometimes reality um, it bites, but it's it's reality. It doesn't change the fact that it's there. So these are, again, things we need to think about. Uh, we need to think about what drugs they're taking, how much of it they're taking, what does it, what does it get in the way of, right? What are some medications that we need to make sure that we avoid in the hospital because this patient's been taking these medications? Um, do we need to change those medications temporarily while we're in the hospital so that it isn't going to cause a large complication, right? So these are things we have to think about, as well as complementary and alternative therapies, because a lot of times people forget that they take medications like stress tabs, because when we ask them about vitamins, um, we know that stress tabs are vitamins, but a lot of people don't. So they will not tell us they're taking stress tabs or ginkgo biloba because they don't think it's a vitamin. They think it is something other than a vitamin because it doesn't say vitamin D, C, A, right? Things of that nature. So they will say no. However, taking ginkgo biloba with medications like Wellbutrin on top of other medications will cause something called serotonin syndrome, which could really, really, really affect somebody long term and uh, cause some really, really bad things to happen. And we will get into that when we start taking or start talking about uh, polypharmacy. So again, things to just put in your brain. Um, I don't want you to be so sprung up on all the little pieces and parts I'm getting into for the sake of your exam. I'm just trying to get you to understand what it is that we're trying to explain to you within the chapter, right? Okay, so now that we have a little bit better of an idea of what we're doing, now we're going to start talking about um, safe practices of drug administration um, when we're using the nursing process because there are a lot of safe practices that we have to use because if we don't do it, someone's going to die. Like I, I wish there was any other way to say that, but that's the reality of the situation. So this is the kind of discussion we need to have. And I hope your ears perked up a little bit. If they did, then you're going to be a great nurse. If they didn't, then maybe think about that for a second because um, it's, it's a very serious topic and um, we should definitely take that and and take it as a serious warning of what happens if if we get burned out and forget what it is to feel so make sure that we're understanding how serious this is and, and what responsibility we truly carry when we're going to be what we're about to be all right so when we talk about nursing process and diagnosis it is going to be different from a healthcare provider versus a nurse so nursing diagnosis is it a diagnosis for a patient? No, it is not a patient. This is your illness diagnosis. Only a physician can do that. Only a provider can do that. Sure. Now, what's the difference? The difference is, is a nursing diagnosis is going to be about goals and health outcomes related to the care plan. What is a care plan? Well, it is a plan that we create that is going to specify what level of care we are giving this patient so that we can anticipate, document, and find uh, correlations in the level of care with the level of health and well being once they are discharged. So this is the difference between a physician diagnosis and a nursing diagnosis. It drove me nuts how I never knew what a nursing diagnosis was. And I was like, why are they making me diagnose? It's because it is a diagnosis based off of a care plan. So case in point, I have a patient who started taking a new blood pressure medication. They fell, they broke their hip. 
I've got them on fall risk protocol because they are a risk for falls. Why? Well, because they got orthostasis, they fell down and they broke their hip. So they are absolutely going to be on falls protocol because they just got their hip fixed. That's an obvious, they got to have it replaced. Otherwise they're not walking. So my nursing diagnosis is a risk for falls for this patient. So the care plan is going to include things like making sure that the side rail um, and bed alarms are up as appropriate to hospital protocol, right? Um, also to make sure that um, if the, the patient is within the first 24 hours, making sure that the um, abductor pillow is put in appropriately so that we don't, you know, dislocate that hip while it's trying to heal appropriately, right? So also another one is risk for, you know, skin integrity issues because we just had um, a pretty nasty surgery, right? So they have to cut down really deep when you're doing that repair. So risk for infections also a problem. Do you see how this works? So you guys, that's all you need to know is nursing diagnosis, what it means as part of the care plan that we create for each patient individually, holistically, um, so that we can predict and track uh, their health outcomes so that we can get them out of the door faster and help them recover quicker. All right, so when we're talking about making nursing diagnoses, so when we are talking about significant health-related problems for the patient, uh, let's see. The first thing I can think of is like impaired or risk for impaired gas exchange uh, related to COPD exacerbation. That would be considered a nursing diagnosis, right? So in that risk um, for uh, impaired gas exchange, what would we do as nurses to try to increase the gas exchange for the patient who has this exacerbation of COPD or the COPD that's going haywire? So the first thing I think of is, um, you know, use of a supplemental oxygen, right? And then the goal would be to keep the patient at a saturation of 90 to 92%, right? That would be a realistic goal or 88 to 92%, somewhere around that area because that's kind of where they live. Um, or uh, increased use of incentive spirometer, right? So that we can uh, hopefully be able to stretch those alveoli, those little bitty sacs that create your lung tissue, right? Or that... Um, that stack together to uh, to create the lung tissue. So there are a lot of different things you could do with that. Uh, meds related to, or meds and related equipment and administering medication. So uh, risk for non-compliance related to uh, patient not understanding how to use insulin um, and insulin syringes to dose medication, right? So that's a thing. So what will be our goal? Our goal would be to have patient work with diabetes educator or diabetes nurse educator uh, to understand how to take medications, right? So this is how kind of that, that works from our end. Um, a lot of people struggle to find a nursing diagnosis with a patient when they're writing care plans because you do have to write them in the hospital. It does not take that long. It's about three clicks at the most. Uh, but when you first start off, it sounds like something that's so hard it, it, when in doubt, always go with anxiety because you could argue that every patient is going to at one point have anxiety. So just when in doubt, use anxiety as a, a good tool when you become a nurse. If you get stuck on, I don't know what to do. All right. So I think you guys get the idea. I'm not going to keep going down the line, but look at these and think if you can think of some nursing diagnosis related to uh, you know, cultural beliefs and, and patient concerns. What would something that would be a deterrent potentially related to cultural beliefs and patient concerns, right? And so on and so forth. And yeah, here we are talking about the same thing we just talked about last slide. So I'll jump through it really quick. Know what a nursing diagnosis is. Know what a goal is for a nursing diagnosis and what the purpose of it is. And again, just revert back to the last slide because I'm not going to go over it again when I just spend a couple of minutes talking about it. Um, I don't want to waste your time. So let's just head over to another slide. All right, so now we're talking about the nursing process portion called planning. All right, so patient goals. That's one of the things that we plan. Uh, we want to educate the patient about medications they're about to start to take, um, any therapies that they might have to take into consideration, right? Um, and, and we have to determine their level of comprehension and their ability to be able to take care of their plan of care when they get home because sometimes there are barriers and we have to make accommodations for those barriers. 
Um, again, patient goals versus nursing goals are a little bit different. Patient goal is what they need um, so that they can be sufficient in keeping themselves stable when they're home. Nursing goals, um, we need to have goals related to what do they need to be able to be successful? What equipment do they need? Do they need, I don't know, a bedside commode? Would that help them out? Do they need, uh, I don't know, uh, do they need a couple of things of TED hose? Do they need a starter kit with insulin and lancets and, and needles ordered for them because they're a brand new diabetic? You know, things of this nature. So our goals are going to be about preparation for them to be able to leave in discharge and their goals are going to be related to uh, ability to create compliance with their level of care. When we are talking about um, medication administration, we also have to take into consideration uh, why we're given the medication to begin with. Also, again, educating the patient on the medication. Do they know that it can't be in the sun? Do they know it's got to be refrigerated? Do they know how to uh, determine how many units of insulin based off of their sliding scale? Do they know how to read a sliding scale? Do they know how to take their blood sugar to determine what the sliding scale is going to yield as far as how many units they're going to need? Um, like I said, there, there are 15 different ways we could look at this. Um, and then creating a teaching plan where they could teach us back. They call that teach back, where they can teach us the medication administration back to us to validate that they are going to be compliant with uh, that medication administration. Now, this slide is pretty silly, but the fact of the matter is, is they want to make sure that you understand that you have to make sure that that medication fits that medication order, which was given by that physician specifically, and there is no deviation to that order. Um, unfortunately, every year we have people who read the medication incorrectly, read it and relate it to another medication, click the wrong medication to order that came from the physician that was a different verbal, did not confirm S-bar, therefore it was, you know, considered 250 milligrams versus 500. This happens all of the time and it's so easy to do. So that is why we go over it 90 times so that you roll your eyes every time you hear me talk about this slide and you go, oh my God, really? Yes, really, really, truly. People have passed in Ohio over a very, 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 very large medication order. So large, in fact, that if I were to tell you, even as a brand new nurse, you would still go, oh, my stars. Yeah, for sure. That's the thing. Um, if you don't believe me, look it up. I'm not going to get into it right now, but trust me, it was a huge thing and lots of people were unfortunately impacted and it is very, very local. So um, this is why we go over these over and over and over. Make sure that your MAR is appropriate to the medication. Furthermore, make sure that medication is appropriate for human consumption, right? Like if it is, I don't know, 2,000 micrograms over what the average person gets, that's a, pro that's a problem. I'm stuttering. Oh boy, do you hear the influx of my voice? This is why I'm frustrated because these things happen. So last time, make sure your MAR make sense with the medication and make sure it makes sense for the patient and make sure the dose makes sense in general. That way there are no big issues and nobody has to suffer. All right, really important point of contingency again. Um, the nurse needs to make sure that the medication is correct for the patient, that it's safe for the patient and the patient's conditions. It's not going to make it worse, right? Um, we have, uh, we need to make sure that the physicians are in the order appropriately. Um, and then we need to make sure, um, that we withhold medication that we fear might cause, um, a bigger condition to erupt as a result of that administration. So, um, how long does it take to clarify? Well, sometimes it takes an hour or so. Uh, sometimes I've had to wait up to an hour to get a medication, but would that have been smarter than dosing that medication? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so it's better to wait because you're only going to be waiting for so long um, versus them getting the medication. Now, are there exceptions to this rule? Yeah, there are some exceptions, but on that MAR, it is going to be annotated that this medication does not shut off for any reason, okay? And when you get that medication, a lot of times you have to verify that you understand those conditions and terms. 
All right. It'll give you like when you scan it, it'll give you a, uh, did you mix this medication appropriately in the IV uh, piggyback? And then you'll click yes. And then it'll say, do you understand that this medication is to run continuous? And you'll have to click yes again to validate that. So Again, making sure that um, we, we understand if something doesn't seem right, we don't dose that medication at all until we've got clarification from the original uh, ordering physician. All right. We need to understand the drug actions, and that is what is it doing to my body and how is it fixing my condition. Um, side effects versus allergies. Side effects are things that we would expect um, case in point, I'm taking an antibiotic, I'm expecting that I'm going to have stomach upset or potentially diarrhea. Like that's just a standard. That's what you would expect. That is not an allergy. Um, a lot of patients like to say it's an allergy so they don't have to take it because of the unsightly side effect. But unfortunately, all they're going to do is get a stronger antibiotic that's just going to do that to them even more harshly. And, um, you eventually will not be able to take certain antibiotics because we've called them, um, allergies versus side effects. Um, so we have to be mindful of those things. Contraindications or medications or things about this uh, medication administration that is going to make the situation worse if we do it. Uh, so the first thing I think of is when we take um, medications for the first time that are blood pressure medications. If we have a patient who has a history of asthma, they can't take a beta blocker. Um, because it makes it more difficult for them to live comfortably with their condition. It can exacerbate or, or it is contraindicated in the patient with asthma because it's going to upset that asthma and potentiate status asthmaticus. Um, so we need to make sure what that means and make sure that we have the right patient uh, who has the right history and can handle that medication. Um, main drug interactions, again, things that we absolutely cannot mix this stuff with. Uh, polypharmacy is a huge issue, continues to be a huge issue, is really hard to manage in a lot of ways. Um, so making sure that we don't have anything that's going to make it worse if they take them together. Um, and we also need to know the influence of one medication because sometimes medications will increase or decrease the effects of other medications. So we have to take that into consideration as well. Okay, so other things we need to consider with medication administration is what do we need to do to prep it? Is it an IV piggyback? Do we have to break a seal? Do we have to mix medication uh, before we spike the bag? Um, things of that nature. How do we refrigerate it? What temperature do we need to have it refrigerated? Um, and, and what does that look like? Uh, let's see, syringes. What type of syringes do we need? Do we need insulin syringes? Do I need you know a Tumi syringe because I'm given a medication? through a tube, um, what do I need to have? Uh, do I have a spacer for an inhaler, things of that nature? Um, and again, when do we need to um, educate the patient and how do we educate the patient and how do we get teach back appropriately related to uh, the patient understanding their medications, the side effects, when they need to call the doctor if things are getting worse and how to administer those medications. All right, now we're going to get into the nine rights. And yes, it is nine rights. And no, there's not going to be any more that I know of. Um, I know that you guys first learned the five rights and then it turned into like the seven rights. And now we're at nine somehow. Um, this is the true uh, rights. So we need to understand what those are because there might be an instance where uh, we're doing our NCLEX or we're taking a standardized assessment test and they say, hey, select all that apply that are part um, of... Uh, safe drug administration, right? So you need to be able to know it's this versus this. All right, we're going to talk about implementation as part of the nursing process. Um, implementation is where we look at the care plan and we start to follow through on what it is that we have anticipated is going to help, help with the overall um, outcomes of the patient. So we are down the line of the nursing process. I am finally implementing um, this care plan. So I'm, I'm giving the patient the education they need to see if they're going to be compliant with their medication. I do the teach back to make sure that they know how to give themselves insulin and verify that they have read it appropriately and they've given the appropriate amount and they did it effectively, yada, 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 right? So that would be the implementation phase. All right. So when we're implementing medication, we need to know the nine rights of giving a drug. And that's going to be the right patient, the right drug, the right dose, the right route, 
uh, the right time, reason, documentation, response, and the right to refuse. So we're going to briefly go over all of those individually so that we understand what that means. And then we should be basically done after that. All right, so the right patient. Um, this is important, write it down. Must identify patient using two identifiers. So ID number, name, and date of birth. Um, we need to make sure we have the right medication with the right patient. Um, there are patients that cannot effectively communicate. So people who have had a stroke, uh, pediatric patients sometimes can't communicate because they can't talk when they're in pain. Sometimes they're too young to talk all together, right? Uh, if they're confused, um, if they're so sick that they can't answer for themselves, there are a lot of reasons that um, we can mess up the right patient. So that's why we need to have these identifiers. Again, making sure that we have the right medication for the right patient for the right condition, right? So um, making sure that it is validated in your brain, it's in the MAR, um, and that we have that medication and we're, we're going in to treat that condition related to that medication. Period, point, paragraph. All right, again, we need to have the right dose. So we need to make sure that that dose isn't going to be too much or not enough. Um, that's why we have labs that we take at, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning and while we're waking patients up because a lot of times we're making sure um, that the medication is doing its job and they don't have too much or too, too little. Uh, so that's why we have to wake them up so early so that we can mix medications and prep it. Um, so that we can give them that morning dose with an effective amount of medication to kill the effective bug, right? Now, right root. We run into problems like this all the time, believe it or not. So in, um, in acute care, hospital-related issues, this happens a bit. Um, the most notable thing I can think of right the second that nurses do often, and I probably shouldn't say this, but it's factual, like I see it all the time, is when uh, we get a withdrawing patient, so somebody who's withdrawing off of uh, medication, alcohol, you name it, right? Um, when we give them a nicotine patch, we give them a 21 milligram patch, but a lot of times um, that doesn't do anything for them because they're used to uh, part of their anxiety kind of being alleviated is that hand to mouth uh, movement. So we will change the root of that medication from you know, the patch to the inhaler. Um, you can't necessarily do that. <laughs> it's not a smart move uh, because you're not supposed to be changing anything without a physician's order. So you'd have to give them a call and change it. Uh, but this is one of the more obvious things that happen because people think, yeah, it's not that big of a deal, but it absolutely can be, um, especially when we're dealing with uh, certain patients who want to harm themselves. Um, so we have to take those things into consideration as well uh, because, well, maybe maybe a patch isn't even suitable for them because maybe they would want to harm themselves by chewing that up. So it's, again, it's uh, making sure that we have the right route for the right medication uh, so that we can give it to them appropriately and we're not doing anything out of regulatory compliance. All right, this one's a big one, right time, believe it or not. Um, right time is important because we have an hour window for dosing medications. We can do it an hour prior or an hour um, post that administration time. So if it's nine, we can go from eight to you know ten. And beyond that, it's considered um, too early or too late and the med is considered overdue. Um, so this is very uh, important because the bigger issue that we have is related to PRN medications because... Some policies say there's a half an hour window that you can give PRM medications. Some say that it absolutely has to be on the dime, Q4, Q6, whatever it is, right? So this is important because it could actually look like we are overdosing a patient if we give it to them at an earlier time, even if it's a one-time dose. So that's why if we have to give a dose early, we will do a separate order for a one-time dose administration versus pulling it as a PRN because it'll look like uh, we chose ourselves to give that medication far too early and we considered, you know, we, we typically or technically we have looked like we've overdosed them even though it was cool per the physician. Um, so these are things we also need to consider and make sure we have clarification over and make sure that we, again, document those appropriately and order those medications appropriately. 
again, the right reason. We need to make sure that this medication is for, you know, this, this problem. Do we have medications that have off-label uses that we use? Sure. All of the time we use Wellbutrin uh, for things like depression. Believe it or not, we also use it for smoking cessation. So um, there's just one common example of, of why I would give that medication to two different types of people. But making sure that it is for the right reason, even if you have to ask a doc and get clarification, I would rather you feel stupid for calling a doc and going, why are we giving this medication? And if they're like, Ugh. It's a blood pressure medication. It's for blood pressure, duh. You know, like you might get it, but I'd rather that happen than you not know what's going on and give a medication not realizing that you were harming somebody. So if you got to be a dork and get yelled at or get huffed and puffed at, cool, man. Just, you know, keep at it. it. You'll figure it out. Always look up your medications. I always encourage you to check your medications first so that you are one step ahead of the average nurse. When you talk to a physician, you got to act like you know what you're talking about. So checking out that medication is the smartest way to do it. Listen to me. The only reason I'm incredibly intelligent is because I was the village idiot before. And through messing up, I've learned how to be quite intelligent. So uh, follow my lead and learn from my mistakes so you don't have them. All right, the right documentation is such a big deal. Here is a key reason why. Um, during COVID, we all got very lazy as nurses and we understood that we had 24 hours to chart something. A lot of times we would jump into rooms and because we were in COVID rooms, we had to be on 100% PPE, so head to toe gear and um, we would have to go in and have everything with us. But what we would have to do is manually override it when we got out of the room because they didn't want to spend an extra time scanning the medications in the room. So what we would do is we would scan it outside of the room. Here's where the problem comes. If I've got 24 hours to document those medications were given, then if I give a PRM medication and I don't document it because I'm exhausted and I wait until the next morning, that medication can be theoretically given in that same time constraint and we've overdosed a patient. It happened. It happened a couple of times when COVID first hit because this was a simple protocol thing that, you know, at the time we were dealing with bigger issues, obviously. So it slipped through the cracks and it did it for a while until we started saying something about it. So again, making sure you've got the right documentation and also making sure if you see a trend of something like that, uh, complicating a process that we're, we're yelling about it. We're blowing the whistle on the situation so that we can figure out how to fix it quicker before somebody gets hurt. All right, this one always confuses people, evaluation of response. So what is the right evaluation of response? That is, that medication gave me, or gave my patient the right response that I expected, right? So I didn't get anything that were unexpected observations and I got exactly what I expected out of that patient based off of my knowledge base on that medication. Does that make sense? So that's what right evaluation of response means. And that's, that's basically all we really need to get into. All right, right to refuse. This one's a big one. If somebody refuses a medication, you need to make sure that you are explaining to them what it means if they are non-compliant with that medication. The most medications that I have ever known to be refused were based off of ignorance of knowledge base of that medication. So a lot of times what that means is basically they didn't understand what that medication was used for. And once I explained it to them, they were like, oh, oh, for real? Oh, okay, fine. I'll do that. Right. So um, there are, again, insulin is probably the easiest one I can think of um, that people are non-compliant over because they don't want to stick themselves. They don't understand how to read um, the, the sliding scale. They don't understand what it means. They get nervous because, you know, they're messing with needles. Like I get all of those things. Um, so again, the right to refuse is a thing, but a lot of times non-compliance is because they just don't have the knowledge base. So if you approach them with dignity and grace and say, hey, listen, do you know this is exactly what's happening to you? And this is how we fix these problems that you're having specifically. They're like, oh, okay, cool. I'll totally get in on that. Um, so make sure that we are properly explaining what that means and what's going to happen to them without that medication. And also throw in there, hey, it's not that big of a deal. Because a lot of people get really, really ate up when they have to start taking medications, especially the gentleman not making fun, just being honest. 
somehow them taking medications makes them feel like they're less than or, you know, I didn't take these before and now I'm taking two medications and I'm kind of chuckling on the inside because I'm like, hey, they're really not that big, but they are to you. Like, again, uh, the right to refuse is such a big deal because uh, people die because they don't take pills. People die because they don't take their antihypertensives because they're stubborn and they don't understand what it means because we are not doing our due diligence to let them know what that means. We need to do a better job doing that, okay? Um, and also making sure that we document that we have tried to educate them and re-educated them and then they still refuse a second time. That's also another key factor I would throw in there. All right, and then um, evaluation of the right response to the drug. This is important. Letting them know that they have to continue the medication is, is one of our biggest issues that we have as well. You have to take this medication. I don't care if you're feeling better. That doesn't mean you can save it for later. That means you have to continue to attack the bug. You have to continue attacking the issue. You cannot just stop because things are getting better, right? Um, making sure that, again, they understand that these are the side effects that are expected side effects that they have to just kind of wing it until it gets better and that it is going to get better. Um, and above all, making sure that they understand that it is not an allergic reaction and making them understand what an, a true allergy is. Um, because we unnecessarily do this all of the time and put patients through more or less testing that they do or do not need based off of uh, these, these small uh, instances of miscommunication. They, they become such a bigger thing than they need to be or not big enough of a thing. Um, so, yep, that's about it. So you made it through your first chapter. Congratulations. It took 51 minutes, but at least you didn't have to read it all because, you know, you got it on audio. Hopefully I wasn't that boring. Um, or hopefully you got a really good nap because I was. So party on whatever way that looks. Um, I will see you for chapter two and so on and so forth. And I hope you enjoyed yourself.